I mentioned previously, there are three signs at Calvary. <clears throat> These are real historical events that point to a deeper spiritual reality. The first sign we talked about already, and that was darkness across the land. And now we will cover the second sign, which is mentioned in Matthew 27, verse 51. The curtain of the temple being torn in two from top to bottom. Now this sermon has two parts. First, we're going to talk about why this curtain being torn is significant. And then second, we will talk about why this is important for our lives. Just as the darkness over the land was not a natural phenomenon, but a direct act of God, so this temple curtain tearing also was a supernatural act. The moment Christ died, God, by his divine power, ripped the curtain apart. And this was a sight to behold. Verse 51 says, Behold, the curtain was torn in two. And the word behold is to see. Like something amazing, ha amazing happened. And everyone needs to come see with their own eyes what is going on. So the t curtain being torn in two, this is not simply a metaphor, but an actual tearing that has immense significance. So let's talk about that significance. To understand what is going on, we need to understand how the temple was designed and, and, and the space for the temple. And it must be noted that this is Herod's rebuilding of the temple, not what was left over from the times of Solomon. And so that's a very significant point to keep in mind. This is Herod's rebuilding of the temple, not Solomon's. And I'm going to show you a picture of the temple, and you will see that it is a court within courts. There was a hierarchy of people who could get closer to God. And God was said to have dwelled in the innermost part, called the most holy of holies. And you have a system in the temple where the outermost courts were the, the least of, of people, and then the more significant people got to get closer and closer. And so you see this picture that I've put up there. And on the right side is the Gentile court. And this court was huge. It's not represented well in this picture. So I'm going to show you another picture that replicates what the court would be like with people in it. And of course, all of these pictures are replicas of what the temple looked like. Only the western hall of Herod's temple is still standing today. So in the Gentile court, that's where Gentiles could gather. And they could go no farther than the Gentile court. They had to be on the outskirts. Never could they go in the inner courts. And if they went beyond their court into the inner parts, they could face the death penalty. And it seems that the Romans allowed the Jews the power to give the death penalty in such cases. An ancient inscription was found with a warning on it. And it's been displayed in a museum in Israel since 1935. And so also on the video there, you can see that inscription found and it reads no man of another nation is to enter within the fence and enclosure round the temple and whoever is caught will have himself to blame that his death ensues well we move in the inner part of the temple and the the next court was called the women's court uh, men and women would both congregate there. But it was called the women's court because women were not allowed beyond that point. And so men would gather in there and eventually get to the men's court. But men and women could, could be in that section. And what this means is that the women were not offering the sacrifices. And women could not watch the sacrifices being done. And women back in this culture didn't have much standing, and they were kept out. They were excluded. They were only marginally better than the Gentiles, who were considered dogs by the Jews. They couldn't get any closer to the most holy of holies where God dwelled. But of course, there were treasure chests available, and women were allowed to make donations. 
Well, we go farther in, and there is the court of men. Only men were able to be in this part. And this court was close to where the priests slaughtered the animals. And so the men were presenting the sacrifices, and, and the men were able to watch. You can see on the picture where the slaughtering tables are and, and, the, and the altar was. Well, going farther in yet, you have the court of the priests. And here only the priests can be doing the sacrifices. They are closer to the most holy of holies yet. And priests could also enter what was called the holy place. All priests could go in the holy place. And that was in that inner building that you could see on the picture. And there was a candlestick and bread and altar of incense. Now there was one more chamber, the Holy of Holies. And what separated the, the holy place from the Holy of Holies was the temple curtain or veil. And only one priest once a year could enter that room. And this was symbolic of the fact that God is holy and nobody on their own has access to him because we are all full of sin. Now when Christ died, the curtain was torn. The separation between the Holy of Holies, where God was said to dwell, and everything else was removed. So the message is that there is access to God now that our sins are forgiven in Christ. There is free access by God's grace. Christ's blood is the ultimate sacrifice that makes us forever clean. It's not just once a year that one person gets to be close to God. We all get to be close to God through Jesus Christ every moment of every day. You see, the cross reconciles us to God. Because God's wrath against us is satisfied on Jesus and our sins are forgiven. And all religious attainment is abolished. It's not about making the cut or being holy on our own. It's not about being holy through ceremonies. It's about access to God through Jesus who was perfect in our place. The veil being torn was a sign that all hierarchical distinctions as a way to be close to God are destroyed. Gentiles who once were considered dogs by the Jews have equal access to God. Women who are thought to be lower than men have equal access to God. And men who are not priests have equal access to God just as much as the priests do. There are no distinctions of who is better and who is not. And this is why Romans 3 verse 23 says, There is no distinction, for all have sinned and all fall short. But we are justified freely by his grace as a gift through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus. There's no distinction between Jew or Gentile. No distinction between man or woman, in terms of access to God. Then in Ephesians 2, verse 14, it says, For Jesus himself is our peace, who has made the two groups one and has destroyed the barrier, the dividing wall of hostility. Well, that dividing wall of hostility was the Gentile courts and the wall that separated the Gentile courts from the court of women and men. While well, the dividing walls of hostility are destroyed. Why? Because the curtain has been torn in two. And so Ephesians is speaking of Jew and Gentile coming together in worship as equals under grace. And since the veil has been torn. I like how Fleming Rutledge, whose work helped me with this message, speaks of the veil being torn. She writes, if you wanted to be close to God, if you wanted to be in, if you wanted to be one of the chosen, if you wanted to be first class, you had to be the high priest, or at least a priest, or anything but a woman or pagan. The whole setup was based on distinctions that separated groups from one another 
and restricted access to the mercy seat. In the moment Jesus died on the cross, all such distinctions came to an end. I think we have a good handle now on the significance of the curtain being torn in two. It is a sign that there is free access to God through Jesus, and we all come to God as equals. We are all sinners needing the grace of God, and nobody is better than any other. And so this leads us to our second point, the implications for our lives. This is good news to us because it means we can rest from all efforts to make the cut. A lot of us are slaves to works in order to earn our way closer to God. We think if only I pray harder, God will accept me. If only I am more faithful with devotions, God will let me in. If only I was a better person, God would let me in. We think by our own efforts, we are moving from the Gentile court closer to the most holy of holies. So we think, whew, I just made it to the women's court, but I'm striving to get to the men's court. We need to realize there's nothing we can do to give us access to God. Nobody can enter the innermost place on our own. And that is where Jesus comes in. By tearing the veil, we all have free access, and it has nothing to do with how well we make the cut. We just receive with faith the free gift of the grace of Jesus Christ. So we can be free of, of being a slave to those works, be free of always wondering if we have to achieve God's favor, if we have to do more things to, to get into his good graces. No, we all have access to God. It's through Jesus, not our good works, not by our status. And many need to hear this right now because in this time of the coronavirus, people are being laid off. There's unemployment. And even people who used to volunteer can't because everything is shut down. The coronavirus has kept a lot of people from doing what they love to do. And as a result, people can feel useless. And there was a theme that kept coming up in some of my phone calls. People felt useless. And we have to be careful of Satan's lies. As we feel useless, Satan may come and say, You are indeed useless. God is disappointed with you. How dare you call yourself a Christian because you are doing nothing. Well, we can confront Satan with that lie. It's not based on what I do. Jesus is my way to the Father. The veil has been torn, devil, so back off. And the veil being torn is also a basis of being free of the hierarchy of our culture. I read of a woman named Holly who went through an experience called Rush, which is a barbarous process designed on the basis of superficial criteria to designate people worthy of being members of sororities in colleges. Well, Holly passed Rush with flying colors, but over time she became disgusted at how judgmental people were in sororities and how they were towards those who were not in them. And this led Holly to become a Rush counselor. She was assigned 11 people to counsel her senior year, and of the 11, only one had gotten into a sorority. And all were devastated. And one was contemplating suicide. And this shows that so many people are living just basing their self-worth on being popular, being accepted, being good enough in the eyes of people, making the cut in the eyes of other people. And in our culture, many people are in or out based on their address, or bloodlines, type of job, athletic prowess, clothing, or color of skin. With the veil torn, we can live life knowing that all such distinctions are just artificial. We don't have to live by them. We don't have to let 
them define us. Being accepted by God through Jesus can be enough for us. Cindy Crawford was once a big-time supermodel in the late 80s, early 90s. And so I, I was born in 1983, and so she's very much was familiar with me at that time. And she said in 1989, not that I heard this quote myself because I was only six years old, but I read this quote. And she said in 1989, I'm sort of at the pinnacle of the model Cindy Crawford. A career should get better as time goes on. So modeling is out. Everyone knows I'm getting old. That's their revenge. This comment reveals several things. There is a small amount of room at the top. And those at the top spend so much time and resources trying to stay at the top. With Jesus Christ, we do not have to spend all of our time trying to get to the top. We do not have to spend time staying at the top if we ever get there. We don't have to worry about failing to be accepted with whatever talents we have. We don't have to worry about not being accepted with our old age because every human being has free access to God through Jesus. The veil has been torn. And so many people are living by the same philosophy as Cindy Crawford did. And that philosophy is destroying them. That the veil has been torn can lead to our freedom from being destroyed by that philosophy. It offers us a better way to live. And the veil being torn frees us from judging others. Perhaps we can say an amen to everything I've been saying. And we love the idea of being inclusive. And we say things like that we hate racism. But then we go right back to our systems of exclusion and restricted clubs. Our Bible studies may exclude people from the community. Our church services may not be geared toward people who are outside the Dutch Reformed tradition. I'm not saying they have to be, but we must be aware that we tend to gravitate toward people who are like us, which can keep others out, even if we don't mean it to. Our church is very educated, so it might be easy to look down upon those who are not educated. Maybe some can look down on Hispanics as being worse than Gentiles because they can't speak English, so we judge them, saying, they better learn English. How dare they come into our country? In having such attitudes, we may be keeping people from God. Well, we, we think, well, they can be saved, but they better not come to my church. And all of those things are exclusive. We are setting up hierarchies and treating people as less deserving of Jesus than others. We need to keep this truth ever before us. The veil has been torn. And if we do, we can make progress in accepting others. We can make progress in being better equipped to welcome visitors in our church. We can make progress in race relations. We can become more aware of our habits of exclusion and be more deliberate to include people in our circles. We can stop making distinctions between people in our heads and realize everybody is on the same playing field in need of grace. We are all sinners. We've equally uh, been damned to hell and we equally need Jesus Christ. So perhaps there is some repenting we need to do. We act like we are the one priest in the most holy of holies while everybody else in the, is in the court of the Gentiles. And if that's been our practice, if that's been our attitude, it's time to ask forgiveness and ask the Holy Spirit to change our hearts. And so just as the temple veil was torn in two, perhaps there are walls in our own hearts that need to be torn down for us to love other people better. And that power to destroy those walls in our own hearts 
is there because Jesus tore the veil of the temple. He died for our sins. He, he rose from the dead. And as we look to Jesus and trust in him and appreciate our salvation more and more, those walls get torn down and we can love people as Jesus loved people. Let's pray. Father in heaven, we give you thanks again for your love and for the sacrifice of Jesus. And we ask that you can enable these words to sink deeply into our hearts. Some of us need a taste of freedom. We've been living by the Cindy Crawford philosophy. Others of us need to have hearts that have melted, hearts with torn down walls. And so whatever we need, give us what we need and make us to be more like Jesus. We pray this in his name. Amen.